Today's topic is copper coils versus aluminum coils. To shorten the title, this is in reference to the indoor evaporator coil of a residential system. Okay, so what you're looking at here is the open view of the evaporator coil plenum box. I'm pointing to where I found a, a leak previously. Uh, that I don't show at this point in the video, but as we go through, I'm going to try to explain this situation as best as I can. If you keep watching the video, um, I'm going to try to make it uh, clear as to the ramifications of this potential problem. Okay, this is the outdoor unit, and uh, this unit is an R22 Freon unit. And initially when I came out to this call, it basically had no charge whatsoever. This was just a trace charge that I put in it to leak sniff the coil. Okay, this is where uh, the uh, condenser has been disconnected. I'm getting ready to uh, install the uh, new condenser. Um, this was an R22 to R410A conversion. Uh, because the leak uh, was in the coil, obviously, you know, there would have been a decision to either just replace the, <clears throat> the coil and uh, continue to use R22 Freon or convert the system and the customer chose to uh, convert the system and go to the new R410A refrigerant. Here you see the uh, new condenser up and running and uh, really uh, standard procedure, uh, really nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, there's been problems with Freon leaks at this house and I'm going to try to touch base on that here coming up in the video if you keep watching. Uh, here coming up uh, show the uh, the uh, temperature drop across the coil. Uh, this, this is fairly typical. I almost always see this because I do the work myself. In my location, our uh, temperature drop parameters are between 15 and 20 degrees. So anytime I hit that 20 degree differential is a, a good thing. Uh, that's always what I want to shoot for obviously that's not always a guarantee because sometimes uh, you can have other problems so uh, basically we had a 75 degree uh, indoor uh, set point you'll see the uh, thermometer that I have set up in the uh, supply is right at 55 degrees which gives us a 20 degree drop which is really uh, a sign that everything is working well you know, obviously, you know, there's other things that go into that, such as pressures and so on and so forth. So coming up next, I leak checked that coil that I pulled out of that job. This is an all aluminum coil. And uh, this is just to demonstrate that while aluminum is typically better than current uh, copper coils, um, doesn't mean they can't fail. So you got to take it for what it is. And uh, as I'm moving the uh, meter back and forth, you know, every time you hear it go off, that means it's detecting a uh, freon leak in, in the coil. And uh, this is just to show you, because visually, trying to look for, a, a, on aluminum coil, trying to look for a yep, leak visually. Aluminum. Got a holding pressure a little over 100 pounds in there, not much. Trying to look for a leak uh, visually on a coil, you're just uh, typically not going to uh, be able to find it. And so that's why I pulled out the meter to show, uh, to give uh, visual representation as to where those leaks actually are. Uh, Freon's building up now, my meter's not, oh, there it goes. Yep, it's bad, no question. Okay, so, uh this is the uh, R22 unit that I just did today, and I uh, decided to compare it like uh, compare it with this one. They were made both uh, roughly in the same same time frame. This this one here is a little bit newer, uh, about 2009, 
uh, was when this unit was made. And the main difference between this one and this one is that this one is a two and a half ton, this is a four ton. So, you know, there's difference in size, it's, you know, capacity. Uh, but this unit holds about 10 pounds, roughly. Um, you know, and obviously, you know, it depends on line set and so on and so forth, but uh, about probably almost half or maybe a little bit a little bit more than half than this one and that one was the coil that was double stacked I'll show you a video of that you know because I'm not going to take the lid back off of it again today but I thought I'd show you you know and uh, this was before they actually went to the the smaller uh, channels because uh, currently this manufacturer makes uh, coils with really small channels and so they've been able to maintain and uh, keep these uh, smaller coils so uh, but even still with the cost R22 uh, you know it's just uh, it's just prone to uh, heavy expense and it's only going to get worse as time goes on so I really believe that that's why uh, people are uh, changing this stuff out because uh, cost of the Freon but uh, anyways, I uh, just thought I'd uh, show you, you know, what the uh, what the coil looks on this. It's not double stacked, but Freon charge is still pretty significant at about 10 pounds. So it's just to show you that, you know, no two units are exactly alike when it comes to the amount of refrigerant needed. Thanks for watching. Refrigerant leaks only occur in the evaporator coil. I wish that were the case. It would make my job that much easier. Uh, this is a still that uh, in which I repaired a uh, Freon leak, R22. And the circumstances involving this one was that the house was being sold. And, uh, and it was an immediate sale. And uh, there were additional uh, problems uh, in regards to this unit. It wasn't, there wasn't just a Freon leak by itself. So... Uh, but the homeowner decided that uh, it was more cost effective to repair the unit as opposed to replacing. So sometimes it just depends. Here's another example of an R22 uh, Freon leak in which I repaired. Uh, because of where it's located makes it easier, makes it e an easy uh, repair option. This was another home that was uh, going to be listed uh, for sale in the near future and so uh, again the homeowner decided that it was more cost effective to repair this leak uh, as opposed to uh, replacing the equipment. Uh, the sound in the background is the uh, refrigerant reclaimer I've got hooked up to the unit that's pulling the refrigerant out of the unit before I make the repair. Um, that's another thing that tends to lead to the costs to a higher cost because I always go back with virgin refrigerant for the premise that when I dump this refrigerant into a drum, it has the potential of becoming uh, contaminated due to acid and other jobs that I do, uh, you know, that I dump the Freon into the jug. And so I always go back with a refrigerant uh, R22 of virgin quality and never reuse old refrigerant for the simple reason that uh, the repair probably won't last due to acidic concerns. If that refrigerant uh, becomes acidic, it will basically eat the windings of the compressor and you'll be looking at a new unit in short order. The old unit going away. Yeah, that's going to be a tight fit. That's going to be a tight fit, boss. It's not a bad little unit. That looks pretty sharp. Not too bad.
Why don't you just repair the copper coil leaks? That's a fair question. Basically, the reason for it is, is that you have uh, formicary corrosion that affects all evaporator coils to one degree or another. Any copper coil made within the past 10, 15, 20 years is going to be affected by formicary corrosion. Because of the cost of copper, manufacturers have continually reduced, tried or attempted to reduce the amount of copper used in their coil by using a thinner tube. And so for that reason, any copper coil is going to be susceptible to formicary corrosion due to the tighter envelopes and tighter structures that are being built today. With that said, formicary corrosion is an ant's nest type of corrosion, which basically produces thousands upon thousands of tiny pinhole leaks. It doesn't make it cost effective to attempt to try to repair the coil. With that said, all aluminum uh, evaporator coils, such as pictured here, are basically not susceptible to formicary corrosion. Uh, the problem is, is that, you know, just because it's not susceptible to formicary corrosion doesn't mean there aren't uh, corrosion characteristics that can affect the coil to one degree or another. This oftentimes, this will vary due to configuration of the, of the system, along with other complications such as VOCs within the home. Uh, and VOC stands for volatile organic compounds. These are compounds that leak from furnishings within the home, paint, adhesive, so on and so forth, that were used to build the home. So uh, to take this a step further, uh, these are older uh, copper coils that I removed on previous jobs. These are sitting out in my trash storage bin before I cut them up and take them to the salvage yard. To show you the diameter of that uh, copper tube going through the coil, I cut, uh, cut an end off of it to show you, you know, the diameter. The, both these coils are, uh, have been manufactured within the, about the past 10 years, 10, 11 years. Um, sometimes they don't even last that long. Sometimes uh, it's as short as eight years. So it really just varies. Um, but the reason why I do this is to show you that, you know, materials, what was used 10 years ago, uh, has greatly degraded. You can see the indentation there on, the, on one of the coils that I'm pointing to. It just goes to show you that there's, you know, likely a very thin, uh, a very thin copper and somebody, something uh, bumped up against it and uh, put a little divot in the, uh, in the bend of the coil. <clears throat> it's not uncommon. This is uh, the uh, condenser that I said that was going to be a tight fit. Um, I'll uh, put another video, a picture in a picture video to show you, you know, which, where this co uh, condenser coil came from. And just realize this is more about evaporator coils than condenser coils, but I just basically use that as a demonstration. So being that I don't have any really, really old uh, evaporator coils to uh, cut metal from so I'm gonna pull it from a condenser because I happen to have a really old uh, condenser uh, here uh, see if I can find the date on here here it is right here 06 of 92 to Lennox and uh, the reason why this one failed uh, was due to a uh, compressor that was shorted to ground compressors right there it was shorted to ground and popping the main breaker and so uh, I converted that unit over to R410 uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut off a little metal off of a uh, couple cut off some tubing off of this and uh, try to see uh, what the thickness is of it and compare it to uh, some coils that I've cut stuff from just a quick peek we could probably bend this up yeah it's considerably thicker not much but you know it's a little bit thicker but we're gonna cut off a little piece off of here and just uh, just to give you a sh to be able to compare what I've cut off the other coils um, inside and we'll bring it inside but I wanted you to show you you know what I'm pulling it from so you have an idea
this was that uh, that tall boy that uh, that I changed out I wound up having to cut out the one that I said that was gonna be a tight fit to change out this is the one I had to dissect and so it's not too bad this was 2006 that's why I just showed you the serial because I couldn't find the uh, serial number on the uh, on the unit itself it was too far worn so it's not too bad you know the thickness back then back in the day uh, it wasn't too bad as I'll show on another piece of that condenser coil I cut out to show you. Okay, in terms of thickness, the one to the far left was off the unit made in 1992. The second one from the left was made in 2006. The other two, or the next one, uh, was taken off of a condenser from 2006 was a thinner tube that feeds the coil. The last one is basically a modern day uh, copper coil, usually somewhere in the vicinity of 10 years old. Um, and beyond that point, we get more into the time span of aluminum type coils. And so uh, that's really about the thinnest I've seen, except for one example that I'm going to show you that's in the background. This coil was taken uh, from a... Uh, from an evaporator basically the it was a video that I did some time ago where I showed that the um, the uh, thin material on the coil was degrading so bad and I really suspected that it was just due to uh, poor maintenance and, and I, I really don't know if it was poor maintenance or poor manufacturing or whatever but it's one of the thinnest materials that I've seen I don't know how well the video will show this but a copper tube is probably the thinnest uh, I've seen out of out of pretty much anything that I've touched over the past 10 years or so. And so that's really the premise why we don't go in there and try to repair a coil is because you get formicary corrosion on uh, any point. And, and the only way to know for sure is to put this thing under a microscope to be able to see uh, if there's any formicary corrosion because you're just not going to be able to see it with the naked eye. You have to put it under a microscope and magnify it probably, I don't know, maybe 52. I think they said somewhere between 52 and 500 times because um, you're just not going to pick it up with the naked eye. So that's primarily why we're going to all aluminum. Uh, but, you know, the, for the purpose of the video, you know, it's just to tell you that, you know, there is no uh, perfect solution. Uh, but this was uh, taken off of the Lennox, the 1992 Lennox condenser. So you can see how much more material there is uh, on that particular uh, uh, condenser. It's very thick. That thing was built like a tank. And like I said before, the reason why I replaced that unit was because the compressor had failed. It suffered electrical uh, breakdown. This one was taken from a 2006 condenser. It was the condenser that I uh, put in the video that said, uh, where I said it was going to be a tight fit to fit it through the fence. I, I basically had to perform surgery. I had to cut it up and to be able to get it outside that fence. But that's just to show you. And this was the one that sprung the leak. And so while the thickness isn't, isn't that bad, it's still uh, considerably less than the... Uh, than the Lennox e equipment uh, back in 1992, which would have been almost 14 years uh, before the making of, of this unit here. So, so that's the state of affairs, and uh, it's only going to get worse as material as material prices increase. Um, it's just the way it is. Thank you for watching. You got one, two, three. But you'll notice none of them are aluminum. They're all copper coils, which is basically another point in this. While aluminum coils can fail, uh, it's pretty rare. I have literally put in hundreds of aluminum coils over the past uh, decade or so. And uh, this is where I cut that fitting off. 
of uh, the coil to show you the uh, diameter of the uh, the tubing. And I did the same thing off this one. Very similar, very similar off both of these coils. There's really not much difference in the diameter. Uh, so uh, that's one thing that I wanted to point out is that uh, while aluminum coils can fail, it's not that common. So, you know, currently it is the better coil, but you can't go into it with a false hope thinking that it will never fail because they can and will fail at some point. That concludes today's topic of copper coils versus aluminum coils. I know this video was long. If you uh, watched the entire video, I really appreciate you watching the video. It took me a lot of time and energy to put this video together. Um, and it is very important from the perspective of understanding uh, manufacturing challenges. Um, and it really it doesn't matter which brand of equipment that you go to, you know, pretty much, you know, all manufacturers are going to use cost cutting measures to one degree or another. Um, so you got to take it for what it is. You know, refrigerant leaks are going to be an ongoing problem, irregardless of the materials used. It's just something that we're going to have to deal with, you know, as an industry. And because the cost of refrigerants have gone up so much over the past few years, um, it requires you to repair the leaks. You know, the, the method of topping off refrigerants of years past is long gone and that is no longer a feasible way to, to do things. One thing that I want to specify in uh, this uh, situation is that this topic is mostly dealing with evaporator coils. There are some manufacturers that make all aluminum uh, condenser coils as well. But for this topic, uh, I'm just talking about uh, evaporator coils because as of 2018, pretty much every manufacturer uh, that manufactures evaporator coils make an all aluminum coil. So, you know, if you've watched the video and you may be somewhat confused because I do use uh, uh, copper condenser coils as a way to show, you know, what the material looked like, you know, long time ago. So, you know, I, I kind of want to straighten that out a little bit, but with that said, uh, aluminum condenser coils, they, they do exist. Uh, it's common knowledge that uh, American Standard and Train make an all aluminum uh, spiny fin uh, condenser coil, um, you know, and there's, and there's pros and cons against that just as much as anything else. Uh, aluminum coils are very uh, reliable you know, as I stated earlier in the video, I've put in many, many, many aluminum coils over the past decade or so. Um, it's very rare uh, that I have a failure, but with that said, I have had failures with them. So you got to put it into context for what it is. Sometimes it's just the nature of the beast, more or less. But uh, if you live in the Katy, Texas, Cypress, Texas, or Richmond, Texas areas, you can give me a call at 832-475-6895. Or, for more information, you can always visit me on my main website at www.austinairco.com. For Austin Air Company, my name's Ray Austin. Thank you for watching the video, and I hope your day is comfortable. Thank you. Happy birthday, Austin Air Company. This year, I celebrate 10 years of being in business. Thank you to everyone who has made this possible. I sincerely appreciate it.